Okay. This is a physics 1C for, oh sorry, physics 1A for March. What are we on here? April 26th. This is hour two. And we're going to talk about this problem, but I wanted to draw your attention to something for next time. So on Thursday, we'll have a continuation of this lecture as normal, but we're also going to start to work on this. So this will be the first kind of lab that we're doing this semester. It's called Ballistic Pendulum. And uh, you can pull it up from Canvas. If you uh, ho Hopefully you can all find this on Canvas. It, I don't know if this was visible before, but it should be visible now according to this. There's a section called Labs. And in that section, you should be able to find this PDF right here. And this PDF is going to have um, instructions kind of on, um, on what you need to do, uh, you know, just just like kind of like a a normal lab, um, and uh, we're just going to kind of go through this together and talk about what you need to do to uh, you know solve it. There's a lot of little you know things you need to answer here, and uh, yeah, so we'll go all through all that together next time. But what you could do to prepare is you you could read this version of this lab. Um, and, um, yeah, we're just, we'll, we'll talk about what you're going to do to prepare this during, during class on Thursday. Okay. So that's just something to think about for next time. It's on campus in case that was unclear. All right. So now we want to look at this, uh, this problem here. So we have a ball with a mass M at the length of, at the end of a string of length L it's moving in a horizontal circular motion as shown at a constant speed V. Maybe there's some kind of machine up here that's making it keep going in a you know circular motion like this. Uh, or someone's just holding their hand here and making it happen. Uh, we want to find an expression for theta in terms of the parameters shown plus g. Okay. Expression for the angle theta related to L, R, velocity, and obviously g as well. That's what we want to do. So ball being whirled in a circle like this. Yes, we will have an we will have a uh, actual class meeting this upcoming Thursday. When is the lab due? I this is the first time I'm doing one of these labs, so I don't know how long it's going to take you. So for now, we're just gonna kind of hmm? in person. Sorry, what did I say? Did I say something that confused you? Sorry, I haven't done any of these labs online. That's what I meant. I don't, I don't know what I said exactly. So. What time will the meeting on Thursday? Normal. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. We meet on Wednesdays, right? We meet on Wednesdays. 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 So sorry. Sorry, I'm getting confused. Normal, normal class time. Not, nothing's changing. It's just like, we'll probably do whatever amount of lecture we need to do right um which which will mean continuing and finishing all this stuff up and then after we're done with that we will all we'll talk about this lab and I'll, I'll kind of go through it with everybody and kind of indicate the things you need to do um to prepare and stuff like that in terms of when it's due it'll probably be due in like two weeks or something like that but uh but i don't know because we'll have to just see how long it takes i'm, I'm sure you can complete it like in an evening i'm sure you can do it like in a night or two but yeah, it, it'll still be on Discord. No, nope, we're not allowed to meet in person. That's not, that's against the rules. Totally against the rules. You know, you, you can go out and you can go to a grocery store and you can go out and you can go to a movie theater now and you can um, do all those things, but we're, we're still not allowed to, to go on campus. And um, hopefully we're going to be having labs in the fall, but, you know, who knows? That could get canceled too. Um, but yeah, unfortunately we... I'm really frustrated and salty about this in case that's not obvious from my tone, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't just go up on campus and do labs, you know? Nope, school is not going to be back for the fall, but labs might be, only labs. And certain courses that require people to be in person are supposedly going to be in person. What those classes are are not going to be physics, so. All right, so ball of mass M at the end of this, but yeah, but I, but I do think 
I think labs will be in person for sure. And I think it's going to be something like half of the students can be in the class or, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll figure something out that is, uh, it's going to be interesting because, yeah, we'll see. All right. So ball of mass M at the end of a string of length L is moving on this path. Uh, all right, so the first thing to do in problems like this is to draw a picture of what's happening, draw a free body diagram. So we want to label the forces that are acting on my uh, my ball right here. What would those forces be in this problem? Okay, the weight's going to go down like this, and there's tension, and that's it, right? So weight and tension. So we'll label the tension as T. I'm just going to label the weight to be M times G. All right. Now, um, as we often have to do with problems like this, we have to define a coordinate system, and then we have to kind of break our vectors up into components. So what I'm going to do is I'll define a coordinate system, and we're going to use this right here. So this is going to be my coordinate system. And um, I should, I'll just make it a different color, make it like yellow or something. So this is going to be the x direction. No, 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 not the x direction. We're going to call this the radial direction. And we're going to call this the y direction. So that's positive y, and that's going to be the positive radial direction. And I call it the radial direction because really this object is spinning in a circle. So at some point in time, it's going to be over here, which means that the radial direction is going to point this way. Or when it's here, it's going to point this way. It's just always going to point towards the center. So if the ball was kind of in the front right here, it would be pointing you know, that way. Okay. All right, so with those directions, we can break up our tension force into components. One that's going to go like this, and then one that's going to go up like this. We'll just fix those. They're actually lined up. Okay. And then since this angle up here is theta, I would argue that that means that this angle right here is theta, which means that this side is going to be t times the cosine of theta. And then this side is obviously going to be t sine theta. Now, when you look at this picture, you might notice that mg and t cosine theta are exactly opposite to each other. And they should be exactly equal to each other, too, if this is truly going to be like a horizontal circle. So that vector and that vector should be the same length. Let me make them actually the same length. But then we have this other vector, t sine theta, which is pointing to the right, right? And it doesn't have really anything else to kind of counterbalance it over here on the left. So that means that that vector produces a force that also has to produce an acceleration. So in addition to these things in the picture, I'm also going to draw in here, not as a force, but I'm just going to indicate that the, the object is accelerating radially in this direction here. Okay. And then what we can do is we can say, apply Newton's laws. Newton's laws say that if we sum up all the forces acting in the y direction on this object, they should be equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration in the y direction. And that if I sum all the forces acting in the radial direction, that should be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration in the radial direction. Okay, in the y direction, there are two forces. There's t cos theta, which is going up, and mg, which is pointing down. And then what's the acceleration in the y direction going to be? Zero. And that's because it says it's a horizontal circular motion. That means that the y coordinate of this object, let's say we call this point y equal to zero, then this would also be y equal to zero, which means that the y coordinate is never changing if it's horizontal. Horizontal means flat relative to the ground. So that means that the ay is zero. Okay, so that means that we know that t cos theta is equal to m times g. In the radial direction, we only have one force, which is t cos t sine theta right here. So we can write t sine theta is equal to m times a radial. And we know that from our derivation at the beginning of class that the radial acceleration is going to depend on the velocity of the object squared divided by the radius of the path. Now, this radius has to be the radius of the circular path itself, right? So let's look back to our picture right here. This is the kind of circle that it's moving in. 
and the radius on the picture here is defined as big R, okay? So we're just going to call that R. But over here to the side, I'm going to say, if we look at our picture, here, let me draw two other lines on here. So if I drop a line straight down like this, and I drop another line straight over like this, then this side right here would be R. I will have made a right triangle. And I can actually say over here, what is R equal to in terms of L and theta? Yeah, L sine theta is gonna be what R is equal to here. That's right. Okay, we'll keep that in mind because r is not one of the variables that we want to have show up in our answer, right? Uh, the only things that we want to have show up in our answer are going to be l, g, and v, I think. I think those are the only variables we want, right? Yeah. Technically, the mass could show up too, but I'm, I'm virtually certain the mass is going to cancel out. Okay, our goal is to find the angle theta, so let's start to eliminate everything except for theta. So we can eliminate the tension by saying from here that, let's keep using black for the derivation. So we can say that t is equal to mg divided by cosine theta. We can plug that t into here, put mg divided by cos theta times sine theta. And this is going to be equal to mv squared divided by the radius. The velocities are going to cancel. We're trying to isolate the angle right here. So this is going to be a little bit tricky because now what we want to do is we actually want to plug in. Let's, let's do this all at the same time. So g sine theta over cosine theta is going to be tan theta. And then on the right-hand side of the equation, we have v squared over r, but r we said was equal to L times sine theta. So now we want to get these variables together here. So let's just put the, the, all the angles on the same side of the equation. So we're going to get something like this. Sine of theta multiplied by the tangent of theta is equal to uh, V squared divided by G times L. So this technically solves the problem because all it really said was to find an expression for theta in terms of the parameters shown. So this is technically an expression for theta, but really it's it's not complete because we kind of, like how would you actually solve for theta here? I mean, you could obviously plug this into a calculator. Like you can plot this whole thing equal to this whole thing and you could see where they intercept if you want to. But uh, what else could you do? How can I how can I just isolate theta in this equation? Any ideas? How could I solve for theta if I had to? I'm sure there's more than one way. Uh, no, because R is kind of an unknown then. Not a bad idea, though. Wow. 
one half of sine two theta. So is this whole thing on the left hand side equal to one half of sine two theta? Or sine squared theta? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, so sine of two theta, so wait, right, okay, I, didn't, I don't know if you meant sine squared or sine of two theta. So sine of two theta is equal to this. Is that what you were thinking of? Yeah, it doesn't exactly work, but you're on the right track. You need to use trig identity. We have to do trig identities, right? That's basically what it is, right? So usually with trig identities, when you don't know what to do, it's best to just write everything in terms of sines and cosines, right? So let's do that. So sine theta times tan theta is technically, um, yeah, that's what we're going to do, Chris. Exactly, that's what we're going to do. So this is sine of theta times the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta. Now you have two different ways that you can go about this. We're going to use the method that, uh, that Chris just said, I think, because that's probably going to take the least number of steps. So what Chris is suggesting is basically we take sine theta times sine theta and we use the identity that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to 1 and then just solve for sine squared theta. So the numerator here becomes 1 minus, <clears throat> yeah, that's how you do it. Yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. That's, what he, that's exactly what he's describing. So 1 minus cos squared theta divided by cos theta. That would be equal to v squared over g times l. And then we turn it into a quadratic, which is what Tom shared right there. So the quadratic is going to look like this. You're going to have g times l minus, sorry, g times l over v squared. You know, that's a bad way to do it. That's a bad way to do it. Just multiply the cosine theta to the right-hand side, and you're going to get 1 minus cos squared theta is equal to v squared over gl cos theta. And then we just turn this into a normal quadratic relationship by getting everything on the same side. So you get 0 equal to cos squared theta plus v squared over gl cos theta, and then minus 1. And then you would just have to plug this all into um, a quadratic equation. But, uh, you know, it would work, you know. And you'd be solving for cos theta, so it would be something like this. You'd write cos theta would be equal to negative b is this, right? So negative v squared over gl. I don't think this, I can't remember if this reduces down to something simple. I don't think it does. Um, plus or minus the square root of this thing squared, which would be v to the 4 over g squared l squared. And then minus 4ac, so that's going to be plus because that's negative. So 4 times cos squared theta. Yeah, you, oh, no, 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 sorry. 4ac. So cos theta is your x, right? So it's going to be 4 times this, which is 1, times the coefficient of this, which is 1. So it's going to end up being plus 4. And then all of that divided by 2 times a, which is just 2. So that's what you would get. You could replace all the sine theta with r over l, and then solve for r. Is that what you mean, Joanne? We could do that, yeah. And then go back at the very end to find theta by using this expression. Yeah. You could do that. That would work, too. Yeah, I don't think this is going to reduce down to something simple. And I don't, I mean, looking at this equation, I can't think... Maybe you could complete the square on this or something like that, but I don't know. So this ends up being your result, basically. This is the answer. And of course, if we knew what, if we picked values for velocity and for L, we, we could get an answer, right? Like, you, you can do it yourself. Like, pick a value for V and pick a value for L, and you can get an answer for what the angle needs to be, right? In fact, we could probably go through here and talk about, like, interesting limits of this, because, for example, there's probably a maximum angle you could possibly get here, right? only so big this angle can be if the angle for example is like really close to 90 degrees then i think the velocity has to be almost infinite for that to happen so you might be able to figure that out by like playing around with this equation but uh, anyway the whole point of this problem is uh to kind of analyze an object that's moving in a circle like this and notice that the the radius in this case happens to be the distance it's not l 
it's this distance here because it's going in this type of a circle. Okay, any questions about this problem? So, four and five are definitely the next two to do. But this one's pretty, yeah, we'll do this one last, I guess. We'll do, we'll do these two next. So starting with example four. It's another symbolic problem, but we will get some problems out of numbers in them here in a second in case symbolic problems bother you. Okay. Um, so, it says, mountain roads are tilted, which means banked, so that even if it were covered with ice, a car can make a horizontal circular turn without sliding off the road. This is probably something you may have seen before if you've driven through the mountains at all. I don't know if any of all of you or any of you have or whatever, but I'm sure some of you have driven along mountain roads and you've noticed that the roads sometimes when you when you when you take a turn, sometimes the, the road you're driving on can be banked. This is also true for some of the um, interstate exits, like the highway exits. Sometimes the highway exits are banked as well. Um, and banked again means that the the turn you're making is at an angle. So it's kind of like this. It'd be like you're traveling in your car and this is like the rear of your car. So here's your wheels. So here's your wheels here and here of your car. And then here's your car. And the car is going into the screen. So what we're looking at here would be like the rear view window. This would be like the, the rear window and there'd be like taillights back here and stuff like that, right? So there's the car. The car's going into the screen. So the curve is banked, okay? So the curve kind of, it, it, it's a curve, so it's kind of circular. Ooh, that looks awful. It's kind of circular, so it kind of goes around in a circle. Can't do it. Can't draw. For Yeah, exactly, Calvin, that's right. For really circular exits, you'll, you'll notice that these, that the, the roads themselves are banked. And it's really helpful for helping you make turns. There's an extreme example of this that occurs in the Olympics. So the Olympics is going to be this year, right? 2021? 20, yeah, they, they postponed them. So there's this there's this cycling event. Maybe I can go find a video of it during the break. There's like one of the cycling events. I think it's called sh Short Track? Or am I thinking of ice skating now? I don't know. But there's this, there's this version of like a bicycle type of race that they do indoors where they basically travel on these extremely like slanted tracks. Does, anyone, does, that, does that ring a bell to anyone else? It's like really, what's it called? The Velodrome? Oh, let's just look that up. Let's let's see what that is. That's probably what it is. Oh, so like I guess you can just go to the. Okay, yeah, this is. Let's see. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, tracks like this basically. So you can see there's that huge slant to the track. You can really see it here. It's that huge slant to the track. Huh? Have you have you ridden on one of these before, Christopher? You can really see it here, right? Can you see how the track is slanted? Like the whole thing is slanted, basically, right? It's just slightly less slanted on the on the straight line edges, but yeah, around the curves, it's all really slanted. It's terrifying. Do you have to go really fast to make sure that you don't like fall off the track, or because yeah, you end up being like, look how look how tilted these guys are. I mean, sure, like when you when you turn in your bicycle, you automatically tilt anyway, right? Anytime you make a turn, you kind of just like lean. That's how people on motorcycles turn. They just lean and then they kind of, it makes them move to the right or left. So anyway, yeah, this is the same idea. Yeah, because of the angle, you have to go really fast to stay stable. Okay, yeah. So hopefully we'll be able to see why that is as we do this problem right here. Okay. So this, this problem is all about that same type of thing. It doesn't have to be a car, any object that's traveling and it's trying to turn. Yeah. So mountain roads are tilted. Uh, it says, if the car is traveling at the right speed, um, the car can basically make a horizontal circular turn without sliding off of the road. So we want to find an expression for the banking angle for a car traveling at a speed V and making a turn of radius R, okay? So what we're going to be trying to solve for here is the angle theta right here. This is our question is, what does the angle need to be um, given a certain speed and a certain radius? And then the answer we get for this is going to tie directly into the next problem, which we'll do with actual numbers, okay? 
So it's it's making a turn of radius r. So what does that mean? Okay, that means that it's going in a kind of circular type of a turn, and the the radius, which is going to be the distance from here to here, we're going to call r. It has a velocity v that's going kind of into the page this way. So I'm not even going to really draw it. So we'll just say the velocity is into the into the screen. We actually have a vector we use for that. It looks like this. We put a little x with a circle. That means a, a vector that goes into the screen, as if you're looking at an arrow going away from you. Yeah, this is three-dimensional, Chris. That's right. So the velocity is going in, and the radius is this way, and the car is turning. And, and this is where the, the picture, it's bad enough picture as it is. But the car is kind of turning this way, OK? It's kind of turning left. So I'll just say the car is turning left. All right. So basically, we want to relate the velocity to the radius to the angle. That's what we want to do. Okay. Now, it's covered with ice. Okay. So that means ice is going to mean that there is no friction, or at least very little friction. We'll just say it means no friction. Okay. All right. So there we go. Now again, if <laughs> this is so hard, I can't I can't possibly draw this. I, I I can do I can't even do this if we were in the classroom. It's just really hard to draw three dimensional pictures on two dimensional spaces when you're just not that good. But 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 this is kind of what you're picturing is happening here. Which one of these pictures? This is probably the best picture I can see right here. Imagine a car that's about to go around a turn like this. Now you know the radius. How do you know the radius? The radius is going to be like the distance between the center of the circular path and this circle right here, right? So you can imagine that there is a circle that has this curvature and its center is somewhere out here. While the velocity is going forwards, you're turning to the left. And that's what's happening. Okay, so there's our incline plane. What are the forces that are acting on the triangle theta? The bank this is the banking angle. What are the forces acting on this car now? It's so obviously weight, right? I hate that once I've put it down, I have no way to interact with it with my pen. So there's the weight and then normal force, yep. So there's weight and then the normal force points up and to the left. Like this. So there's N. Now, What's the direction of the acceleration of this object? What's the direction of the acceleration? And let's assume it's moving around this banked term with a constant speed. What's the direction of the acceleration going to be? It's going to be left. That's right. So the acceleration in this case is going to be pointing to the left. That's going to be our radial acceleration vector. Now, it specifically says to um, even covered in ice, a car can make a horizontal on the tr turn without sliding off the road, right? So if it's not sliding, that means it's not sliding up and it's not sliding down. It's basically just maintaining its same elevation right here, right? Okay. Let's throw in our coordinate system now. So this is going to be our coordinate system. Um, let's put it right here. Okay. So this is going to be the radial direction. This is going to be the positive y direction right here. And we have a banking angle theta right here, which is going to be the same as this angle here, which is going to be the same as this angle right here. And that means we can make um, components for our normal vector here. And they'll look like this. 
and like this. So if those angles are theta right there, that also means this upper angle right here is theta, which means we can break the normal force into components. This is going to be n times the sine of theta, and this down here would be n cos theta. All right. So now we can kind of put everything together and say Net force in the radial directions, ra uh, the radial direction is going to be equal to ma times the mass of the object times the acceleration in the radial direction, and then we can also write put it over here. Net force in the y direction is going to be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration in the y direction. Sorry, are there any questions? Or comments about how I drew this? Oh, those cosines and sines are wrong. Yeah, for sure. I see that now too. See, theta's here, so that means this is the cosine side, and this is the sine side side. Thank you for noticing that. Would n be equal to mg cos theta? Yes. Yes, Joanne, it would. Yep. Oh, I didn't even... God, I, I apologize. I For whatever reason, I'm just... I don't know. I'm just not feeling really... Like, it didn't feel great when I woke up this morning. I'm not, like, sick or anything. I just, like, something's off today. I don't know what it is. Um, I ch so this is the direction of the radial acceleration, right? And I chose to make the positive R direction point in that direction here. Which, this is kind of different from problems that we've done like this in the past. Like, normally when we have, like, a block on an inclined plane we make the direction of the inclined plane to be one of our axes, right? So we're not doing that here because when an object is traveling in a circle like this, its radial acceleration is directly towards the center, which means that it's not accelerating down the ramp. It's actually going to stay on the ramp. And that kind of goes directly into what I would say next, which is the acceleration in the y direction is going to be zero. It's going to basically stay on the same level as it's going around this track. So what you said is true, Joanne, but it's going to be kind of weird for what I, what I write next. Because if I the next thing I'm going to write is if we look at the y direction right here, in points up, right? So OK, the answer to your question, Joanne, is actually no. That's not true in this particular case. It's not true in this case. And you, I'll show you why here in a second. OK, so net force in the y direction, in cos theta goes up. The weight, which is mg, I'll just write mg, is pointing down. So minus mg should be equal to 0. So that means the normal force is actually equal to mg divided by cosine theta. So that's true, Joanne, when the acceleration is along the incline. That would be true if the acceleration was along the incline. But because the acceleration is to the left right here, that's not true anymore. Can you see that? Does that make sense? OK, yeah, yeah. Because when, when the acceleration is along the incline, then this becomes the y direction, right? And then n and mg cos theta balance each other because there is no acceleration in that direction and all the acceleration is this way. But if you look at it, y is this way and a rads, rads that way, then there is some component of the acceleration that points parallel or as a component for this direction of y. Oh my god, the words I'm using today are just awful. Okay, so going back to the radial radial force direction, um, there's only one force pointing in the radial direction, that's n sine theta. So we'll have n sine theta over here on the left. And on the right, we're going to have m times a radial. And what's a radial again? Well, that's what we did at the very, very beginning of class. We said radial acceleration is v squared over r. So every time we see that show up, we're always going to put the same thing in there. So on the right-hand side, radial acceleration is going to be v squared divided by the radius. And from here, we're just going to kind of plug everything together. So I'm just going to stop again and ask, does anyone have any questions about how we got here? 
Any questions about any of those steps? Okay, so we can plug the normal force into this first equation so that it says mg sine theta divided by cos theta. And then the right hand side is going to be m times v squared divided by r. We can solve this for theta because now we can divide the g over here. And so we end up getting on the left hand side the tangent of theta is going to be equal to v squared divided by r times g. Notice this r times g thing showing up once again. It sh I think it showed up in the last problem too, right? Right here. And then right here. Shows up a lot in these kind of problems, r times g. And then of course that allows us to say that the angle theta is going to be the inverse tangent of the velocity squared divided by the radius times gravity. So if we knew what those values were, any of these, if we knew the angle, the radius and gravity, we could find v and so on and so forth. Okay. Now this is kind of cool, right? Because remember that this problem started by saying that the roads were icy, so no friction. But notice that as a result of the bank, the road itself, look what it does. The road itself actually makes the car get pushed to the left. So if I'm going forward and I want to turn left, if the road just, if the road just tilts just a little bit, then as I try to turn, the road is the road basically pushes on me, right? That's what it does, right? And the component of the road that pushes you to the left is going to allow you to make that left-hand turn. And it's the same here as it is with these cyclists, right? If they just if they literally if they just keep driving straight and they go fast enough, as Chris was saying, it'll automatically make them go left. Does that make sense? So that's kind of powerful. It's, it's a good reason to, to curb these roads because it kind of like forces people to turn without having to worry about a grip on the tires because normally the way that we turn is because our tires have a grip on the road. And when we turn left, the, the wheels turn, which makes it so that our path you know moves in a certain way. But if there's ice on the road and you turn left. So let's say you're, let's say you're traveling across a sheet of ice, right? right? And you're in your car and you're right here. And let's say your, your, your car is already moving in this direction, right? What's going to happen when you turn your wheels? In terms of the direction the car is moving, if you're, if you're on a, a bed of ice. Nothing. Yeah, the wheels are going to do nothing for you, right? You'll turn your wheels, but the car is going to continue to, it's going to skid forward now. So it might be the case that while you're going straight, the wheels are rolling. Um, because maybe there's just enough friction to get the wheels to roll. But if you turn, your your wheels are just going to keep sliding in the same direction, basically, right? However, if the road that you're on, or if the surface you're on actually gets tilted just a little bit, then it's going to make you actually kind of swerve off to the left, which is what you want. And again, that's happening because this component of the normal force is pushing on you. The road is pushing on you and making you go left. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is look at the second half of this problem, which has numbers in it. Okay, so same setup as the previous problem. It says a mountain road has a turn radius of 500 feet. So we're given the radius R is 500 feet. It's banked for a, the, the road is banked for a speed of 30 miles an hour. Okay, so let's, um, uh, I don't know what I want to call that. Let, let's call it V1 or something like that is 30 miles an hour. It says, if fast Florence takes this turn at 60 miles an hour, find the minimum coefficient of friction such that her car does not slip. Okay. So we want to figure out how much friction does this car need so that it can take this turn, which was designed for a speed of 30 miles an hour and be able to take it at a speed of 60 miles an hour. Okay. Does that setup make sense? 
Let's, let me let you all read this and kind of write some stuff down first. Just take, take 30 seconds or so to read that and take that problem in. What we're going to do first is kind of like look at this first sentence. It says, a mountain road has a turn radius of 500 feet and it's banked for a speed of 30 miles an hour. That means that it's designed for a speed of this. Okay. Now, what we figured out in the last problem is that if I'm given a radius and a speed, I can figure out what the banking angle is, right? Like we're not, we're not actually given the angle in this problem, right? But technically, from the previous problem, we figured out that there's a direct connection between the radius of the turn and the banking angle. Right? That's what this whole problem was about here. So let's solve for theta. So we got to be kind of careful now, because if I just blindly plug r in feet and v1 in miles per hour, then I'm going to get some issues with uh, units inside of here, right? So really, I need to convert this to feet per second. So let's do that. So 30 miles per hour. So 30 miles per hour. Do I need to write miles? Maybe I should. Uh, if I want to convert to feet per second, then I need to know the number of feet in a mile, which is 5280 feet is the number of feet in a mile. And then I also need to know the number of seconds in an hour. So we want the denominator to have seconds in it. So we're going to have 3,600 seconds down here. That's 60 seconds in a minute times 60 minutes per hour. We'll give you 3,600 total seconds, 60 times 60. And that should give us a value for what we call, let's call this V1, like I said. I think it's like 44. That's my guess. I think that's what it is. So 5280 divided by 3600 times 30. This is 44. Not exactly. And I didn't just do that in my head. It's just I just remembered this from doing this problem a couple years ago or last year. So if that's our if that's our velocity and our goal now is to figure the angle because again, it's like, it's a mountain road, turn radius 500 feet, it's banked for this speed. That's gonna allow us to find this angle right here, right? So then our angle theta should be equal to the arc tangent of V squared, which is 44. Divided by the radius of the turn, which is 500 feet. and then multiplied by gravity, which I need everything to be in feet per second. So for gravity, I need feet per second squared. And the acceleration due to gravity in English units is 32 feet per second squared. And if I did everything right here, the units should perfectly cancel out. Yep, the units in the numerator have feet squared, feet times feet, and then second squared, second squared. So this allows us to find the angle. I think the angle is like six something. Does anyone have any questions about what's going on here? Okay, so we got our angle now. Any questions or is everybody all set? Does everyone agree? Do you get the same answers? 44 feet per second and 6.9 degrees? Okay. So let's go to the second half of this. So it says, if someone takes this turn at 60 miles an hour, 
find the minimum coefficient of friction such that the car does not slip. So now there's going to be a, a coefficient of friction that's going to show up now, which means we're going to add friction to the problem, which is going to make it a little bit trickier. And we're going to change the speed up to 60 miles an hour. So the person's going faster than they kind of should, basically, on this turn, which I'm sure you've all done, too. I mean, I, I, I drive faster than I'm supposed to on, on roads, too. So um, the next thing to do, maybe I shouldn't just immediately say it. What would you all do? What do I do next to try to solve this problem? Free body diagram, exactly. Okay, you answered very quick. So that's good. That's good. There's nothing else to do, right? Yeah, try to draw a free body diagram with the given information and friction. So basically, we just need to do what we did before, but just add friction to it, right? Okay, so start off with the inclined plane. It is now inclined at a very, very shallow angle. But drawing an angle of six degrees would be like this. That's kind of silly. So we're going to make it a little bit bigger. All right, so that's the, that's the inclined plane that the person's traveling along. And this is our angle theta right here. And then let's go way up here. So now we start drawing forces. So same forces we had before. We're going to have um, normal force going this way. Let's make our forces like black or something. OK, so we need three of these. There's going to be gravity pointing downwards. So make the gravity go down like this, straight down. And there's going to be a friction force. Now, what direction do I want to make the friction? Do I want to make it point down the ramp or up the ramp? Is it going to point this way? Or is it going to point this way? Okay, most people are saying to the right, up the ramp like this. Now, if this person was just sitting still on the, the track, I would agree with you that the friction force would be pointing up and to the right because the natural inclination would be for the car to want to slide down the track, right? Everyone agree? That if the car was at rest, there's no question the friction force would be pointing like this. Let me label these things, by the way. So this was the weight, this was the normal force, and what I'm trying to draw now is friction. But we're going to figure out what direction it points first. Maybe it's up, I don't know, but, but let's talk through it. So everyone agrees that if this was just a block and it was sliding down a ramp, if it was sliding down, the friction would definitely go to the right, right? But if it was sliding up the ramp, the friction would point to the left, yeah? Now, I want you to think about your own personal experience of, everyone agree with that? That if, if, if I slide a box, box up the ramp, the friction goes down the ramp. And if the box is sliding down the ramp, the friction goes back up the ramp. It's always opposite to the direction that it's going, right? So here's what I want you to think about. If you were driving on a, in a, on a road like this, what would happen to your car if you went faster than you should? So, you know, when you're taking, um, I think the easiest thing to compare this to is if you're taking an exit ramp on a road, a lot of these exit ramps are, are banked and they, t they turn as well, right? What happens to you physically if you try to go faster than you're supposed to? You know, it might say that the speed limit is 25 miles an hour. What happens to your car if you try to go faster than you should? Is it going to kind of push you outwards? It gets harder to turn, right? And the fact that it's harder to turn means that you're trying really hard to make your car go right, but the car really wants to go the other way, right? So let's say, let's say you're let's say you're making a turn that goes this way, so we can all be thinking of the same idea. So you're taking an exit ramp, and here's your exit ramp. Okay, and here's your car, right? The fast. So if you're going really fast, that's a really good way of putting it, Haiti. And Brand's on the right track too. If, if I want to turn to the right, but I go too fast, it gets re it's, it's like physically hard to even hold the steering wheel, right? You can feel it in the steering wheel. It's, it's, you literally feel it in the steering wheel, right? Like you're trying to turn, but if you try to go too fast, you're, you're, it's like your wheels are, are pulling the opposite way, right? Your wheels kind of want to go straight, but you're making it turn. And that's because of inertia, right? When you try to make a right turn, your car really wants to keep going straight because that's what that's the direction of the inertia of the car, right? The inertia or the momentum of your car is carrying it forwards. So in order to make it turn, right, um, you've got to pull really hard on the steering wheel, okay? So that's an indication that the faster you go, the more the car wants to do this. The, the faster you go, the more the car wants to keep going in a straight line. 
which is up up to the higher point on the ramp. Or well, for us over here, up to the higher point on the left or ramp, right? So when when I go too fast, as as Bran said, you, you kind of tend to want to like kind of fly off of the ramp, right? What happens to your body? If I'm sitting here in my car, so this is me, let's say, and and I and I'm I'm taking this turn right here. What direction does your body go as you try to make one of these turns? Do you find that you're kind of leaning to the right when you make these rightward turns? Yeah, that's the right connection, Hudson, that's right. So that means, right, if we come back to this picture right here now, since the person's turning left, it's the opposite, but that means the friction actually has to go down the ramp. Oops. The friction has to actually go down the ramp, because the faster that this person takes this turn, the more that their car is going to want to get pushed up the ramp, basically. Yeah, you get tilted, so, yeah, going back to this, Kelvin says, if I'm turning to the right you get tilted toward the opposite direction of the turn. So your body naturally is going to want to kind of go to the left, right? So if I turn right, my body goes left. If I turn left, my body goes right, right? It's always the opposite of what you're doing. And it's because your body has inertia. Same thing is true of objects inside of the car, right? So imagine if in the back seat, so let's say this is the back seat of the car over here, right? And let's say in the inside of the car, in the back seat, I have a basketball and it's just sitting on the back seat, right? And it's over here on the right-hand side. If I make this turn, what direction is the basketball going to go? It's going to roll this way, and it might fall kind of like into the ground or something, right? Yeah. The friction would be opposite of the direction your body moves in the turn. That's right, Haiti. Assuming you're trying to go too fast. Because the reality is that if you go too slow... The friction is going to go the other direction. Do you all understand that? So this is the direction of friction in the problem because it says that the person's taking a turn that's designed for 30 miles an hour, but they're going too fast, right? Because they're going too fast, the friction has to kind of pull them in to prevent them from flying off the road, right? But what if this person took the turn at a speed that was less than 30 miles an hour? Remember that it's an icy road, right? So if they're not going fast enough, they will tend to slide down the ramp, which means the friction would actually point the other way. So the direction of friction depends on if you're going too fast or too slow, basically. When you go too fast, the friction's down the ramp. When you go too slow, the friction's up the ramp, basically. And there's going to be kind of a, a sweet spot of speeds where, um, where you can take the turn without sliding off, basically. Okay. So our goal is to find the minimum coefficient of friction. And I'm going to tell you right now that it's going to be static friction such that the car doesn't slip. Now, why is it static friction? Oops. So it's static friction because, oh, you want to answer? Someone's going to try to, go ahead. Yeah, it's. It's rolling forwards, but as, as far as like left and right relative to the ramp, it's basically not moving. The, these wheels on the car, they only roll in the forward direction. They don't roll left and right, right? And yeah, exactly, Kelvin. So both of those answers are right. We don't want the car to slide up or down, so it has to be static friction. Now, the car is rolling forwards, but actually one other thing I would say is that even when an object rolls it's technically still static friction. Because for a moment, when an object is rolling across the surface, this is something we're going to get into in the next couple chapters, but if an object like a wheel is rolling on a surface like this, first of all, the only way anything can roll is if you have friction, okay? Uh, if you've ever tried to, if you've ever got your tires stuck in the mud and uh, you want to get out, what will happen is that you try to turn your, turn the, or you try to drive, but the wheels spin in place. It's because they can't get traction. So in order for something to move, you have to have friction. But the reality is that if you look at this point at the very, very, very bottom right here, when an object is rolling, this point is instantaneously at rest with the ground. And as a result of that, the friction that it, that it makes with the ground right here is a type of static friction. You get static friction when things roll. Okay? And if the wheel slips in some way, then it becomes kinetic friction. But if you think about it, you never want your wheels to slip, right? That's why wheels are designed with rubber and 
concrete and rubber have a really, really good uh, amount of friction between the two of them. Anyway, so, so a wheel that's rolling, this thing at the bottom right here, it's also static friction. Because kind of, I think about it like walking. When you walk along the, the road, it's also static friction between your feet, right? That one's probably more obvious, right? That for just a moment, as you're trying to walk, like your back foot is always at rest, right? You know, you, you put one foot in front of the other, and at any moment in time, you want to make sure you, you maintain traction, right? So, so yeah. Also static friction. Yeah, static holds you in place. What also holds the contact point between like a wheel or a tire and the road, because it has to kind of like push off of this, right? It has to kind of push off to go forwards. Um, anyway, okay, so let's, let's apply that idea to this problem right here. We're really running low on time. We should almost just take another break. We could not take a break and then just in class a little earlier, I guess. We could do this problem and then do this other one too. How do you all feel about that? If we just don't take a break and I just, I end like 20 to 30 minutes early. Is that okay? So we would end at like 4:40. So we, we're gonna go. We're gonna keep going for like 20 to 30 minutes, basically, but no more. I'm not gonna. I know it's really hard to just sit there and and listen to this stuff. So I'm not. We're not gonna go super long. Okay. So so there's our picture, and again, we need to label the direction of the acceleration in our picture here. So since it's going in, in a circular path, we're gonna make the direction of the acceleration point to the left here. So that's our acceleration direction. Make that red. Okay, it switched. Oops, there we go. Okay, so that's our direction for our acceleration. That's our radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration, whatever you want to call it. Um, we also need to drop our, um, this on here. We need to put the, the coordinate system. I like that because the N is like so close to it, but that's okay. We can put the forces on this side. Okay, so now we're actually going to have to break up, unfortunately, both the friction force and the normal force into components, which kind of sucks, but there's really nothing we can do about it. It's just, it's just, that's what has to happen here. Neither one of them is pointing along one of our axes, right? So again, this is plus Y, and this is going to be the radial direction. So this is the positive R direction. So let's go ahead and break up our vectors into components. I'll use purple, I guess. So we're going to have one component of this. Whoops. It's going to go this way. And then the other component, get rid of that, goes to the left. If that's theta, then this is theta, which means this side over here. Um, I'm just doing that. Because in in uh, Haiti, in the other problems we had done in terms of the axis, like everything was like nice and like either it's like left and right, you know what I mean? I don't know. Um, it, it was easier to just say, like, I guess I could have done this. I could have just been like, this is the positive R direction and this is the positive Y direction. I guess that would have been fine. Um, I guess I just recently started doing this as I was explaining things to people in office hours and stuff. And so I was like, I realized that maybe this is more useful if I actually draw the axes on the picture. I don't know. Maybe it's more confusing. <laughs> I don't know what's. I really don't know because you can do either one. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to say it's it's wrong if you if you don't do this. Okay. I was just trying kind of trying just like a different way of explaining it. That's all. Yeah. Okay. So if this is n, then uh, this was this is n cos theta. And then this little piece down here, I'll just say like this, is in sine theta. Okay. Yeah. Kelvin, that's right. Okay, and now we got to break up F sub S, which is pointing down at this angle right here, into components. Um, let's do those below the axis. That'll probably be easier to see. I'm going to use this blue color. So F S is going to break up into a component that goes this way. And then it's going to have a component that goes off to the left, like this. Make this one a little bit shorter. And click it. 
There we go. Okay, so if that angle is theta, that means this angle inside of here is also theta. So then this is gonna be, hopefully I got these right this time, fs sine theta right here. And then this will be fs cos theta on the bottom. Okay, I think we're all set. And so now, notice that the sines and cosines are reversed here, right? The, the quote, radial direction for the normal force has n sine theta. And for the friction force, it has cosine theta. But that's, that's accurate, because the angles are in different places here. OK, so let's take that picture, and let's write our equation. So we're going to have net force acting in Radial direction is equal to m a radial. By the way, you don't need to keep writing r a d every time. You could just write. Some people will write. You could also write this. Oops. You could say net force acting in the centripetal direction would be equal to m a c. That's acceptable. You could also just put an r subscript. Just choose whatever you want. I don't really care. I'll be able to. I'll, I'll be able to tell what you're doing. All right. So, and then of course the other equation is going to be net force acting and the y direction is equal to may. Again, our goal here is to make it so that this person doesn't slide up the ramp. So that means that the y direction acceleration is going to be zero because the elevation is going to be constant. So let's look at the y one first. That's going to be the easier one to do. So what do we have in the y direction? We've got n cos theta, which is pointing up, like there. And w, which is pointing down. And fs sine theta, which is also pointing down. Why does it have to do that in theta equals zero? I could really write a lot faster if I didn't have to slow down and wait for it to like, you know, connect all the weird lines that it's gonna connect. So we got that. And we also have um, another thing we can put in here. Let's, um, let's erase some of this stuff. The other equation we're gonna have to use is that the friction force is gonna be equal to um, mu s times the normal force. Now I know normally it's this is the maximum friction force, but since our goal is to find, just to remind you what we're doing here, we're trying to find the minimum value of the coefficient of friction. So if it's the minimum value here, it's gonna kind of correspond to the biggest value you're possibly gonna get for the static friction force, right? So it's like, I know that's kind of weird to say minimum coefficient, but then maximum force. But the, the reality is that, um, yeah, hopefully that makes some kind of sense. Okay, what's left? Radial direction over here. We've got in the radial direction, we've got um, n sine theta. That's pointing in the positive radial direction. And fs cos theta, also pointing in the same direction. And these should all be equal to m times a radial, which is going to be equal to m times v squared divided by the radius of our path. And uh, yeah, so I think we're good to go here. We now want to apply this everywhere we can. I think what I'll do in the right equation right here, I'm going to move the weight to the right hand side. And I'll write n cos theta minus fs is mu s times n and then sine theta. All this is going to be equal to the weight, which is equal to mg. Do the same thing over here. So we'll have n sine theta plus fs, which is mu s times n times cos theta is equal to mv squared divided by r. OK, so two pretty similar equations. In both cases, we can factor out the normal force. And now, now we're able to solve. Oh, wait. Yeah. Now we're able to solve. And our goal was to find mu, right? So we're going to have to isolate mu here. But uh, before we get into all that algebra, this is going to be quite a bit of algebra now. But you, you all be, have, should have no problem following it. Does anyone have any questions up to this point, though? Okay, 
If not, then um, what's the best way to do this? We want to isolate Mew, so we're going to have to get rid of Normal Force. And we can basically just do this way, I guess. N is equal to mg divided by all of this. And then we can take that and we can plug it in for N over here. Come on. Paste. So we're plugging that in for N, which means we'll take this, plug it right there. So all I've really done here is just to isolate the normal force and then substitute this in for the normal force here. So n now is this times sine theta. That whole numerator is still there. This mg shows up right here, and that denominator shows up down there. That's all equal to mv squared divided by r. We can now eliminate m from both sides, and the only way to get mu out of here would be to just kind of cross multiply, right? So we'll take r times this part. Since the copy paste feature seems to be kind of slow, I'm just going to go ahead and write it. It's probably faster. v squared times this part. In fact, I want to kind of go ahead and multiply it out too. So it's going to be v squared times cos theta minus v squared mu s sine theta. Have I made any mistakes yet, Calvin? Did you notice? The left-hand side, here, let's get rid of these. Yeah, did I drop the G? Darn it. Yeah, there's a G right here. That is G right there. So there should be G times R right here, right? Right there. Thank you. Thanks for noticing that. Hopefully that looks okay. Multiply the left-hand side out. We're going to get... I'm going to kind of write it a little bit differently. It's going to be RG. Ah, so now we're getting to that part where you can't see what I'm writing anymore. So it's RG times sine theta plus mu s cos theta is equal to V squared cos theta plus V squared mu s. Sine theta, our goal is to solve for mu, right? So we want to get those on the same side of the equation. Let's add the negative one to the left-hand side. So I'm going to have mu s multiplied by, this one's going to have a cos theta minus, or plus. We're adding this term to the left-hand side. So we're also going to have a v squared sine theta. I see people typing, which makes me worried that I've already made a mistake again, which is very possible. What did I do so far? Gr, yep, right here, because I didn't multiply this through. This should be times rg. Godzy. Right, we're just gonna we're gonna start over again because that's just really bad. I don't I don't want people to get confused. Okay, distribute this through. You get R G times sine of theta plus R G mu s cos theta. I need to focus on what I'm doing. I keep like looking out of the corner of my screen to look at the Discord, but I should just focus on what I'm doing and just make sure I don't make any algebraic mistakes. That being said, I still make algebraic mistakes even when I'm focusing. Okay, now we want to get the mu s's together. So we're going to have mu s times, this term has mu s times rg cos theta. That's going to go here. This term has mu s times v squared sine theta is equal to v squared cos theta. That stays minus... Um, this term, rg sine theta. And now we're actually done because mu s is going to be equal to v squared cos theta minus rg sine theta, all divided by this thing. And now we can kind of check to make sure that our units make some kind of a sense. And actually, Let's write it in a way that's uh, kind of symmetric, or, well, not exactly symmetric, but kind of similar. Which is, let's put the v squared sine theta first. 
So this makes no difference. It just kind of makes it look prettier. Plus, and then put the RG's cosine thing in a second. And there we go. That's our answer. That's what mu s is equal to, which we can plug numbers into now. Because v is 60 miles an hour. And what else do we know? R is 500 feet. Those are the information we're going to put in. And then theta is 6.9. Let's write all that down here. So V was 60 miles per hour. We figured out that 30 miles an hour was 44 feet. So what's 60 miles an hour going to be? Yep, yeah, 88. So this is 88 feet per second. R was 500, and then the angle was 6.9 degrees. So basically taking all of that data right there, no, it is 60 for this one, Hudson. Let's look. Let's go, we'll go back. Look. So it says a mountain road has a turn radius and is banked for 30 miles an hour. If this person takes the turn at 60, find the minimum coefficient of friction. So we, we do want 60 miles an hour. You can. You can convert all this stuff to meters per second if you want to. That'll work. But... It'll also work if we leave everything in feet per second. Um, I, I don't want you to. I don't want you to think that you you can just willy nilly just use any units. But as long as I get everything in feet, seconds, slugs, you know, pounds. As long as I use everything in the same system of units, it'll be okay. And part of the reason why we do this kind of stuff is because whether you believe it or not, in modern engineering firms, they still do stuff with feet and inches and stuff like that and PSI instead of Pascal's, you know what I mean? So that's part of the reason why I'm exposing you to a lot of this stuff is because I know that most of you have probably grown up, even if you grew up, no matter where you grew up, if you don't grow up in America, you're 100% gonna learn things in metric. If you grew up in America, you're gonna learn things in metric, right? Um, that's just what we've been, that's what our, our school system, our education system has been doing for, for so long is like we've been kind of ignoring inches, feet, pounds, and all that stuff, and just like giving everything a metric because it's easier, it's better, right? But that doesn't mean that the business world has immediately like latched onto that, right? There are still engineering firms that you do things in feet and stuff like that, right? You're still gonna get like, you're gonna be working on problems when you get jobs where like they want you to do things in inches and feet, right? So that, that's trying to give you some exposure to it because for me, I would never wanna use this stuff. I know using feet and inches and stuff sucks, but it's just, you got to learn how to do it, right? And the only way you're going to learn is if you, like, do problems with it. Okay, so, good question, though. Uh, we definitely could convert these in meters per second, and you can you can check. You'll get the same answer. Okay, so we basically want to solve this. So what is mu s equals v squared is... And then for G, we have to plug in 32. And then... Okay, tell me what you get. negative number in the denominator. I must have made a mistake. Oh, because it's supposed to be plus. Yeah. That makes sense. Let's 
a good thing that the numerator is positive there, right? Because if it was negative, we would have made a mistake. Three, four, two, yeah, that's looks like what everybody else wants. Yeah, that's good. And of course, the, the final answer is kind of like less important than just understanding the method that we got through here, but this is a pretty long problem, honestly. You know? I mean, the setup's pretty straightforward. Just a standard uh, circular motion kind of problem, but the math is, is pretty hard. I'm pretty sure you have a homework problem that's like this. Um, yeah. Now, another type of question that you could ask, that you could ask this question kind of in reverse, which is what you might see show up in your homework, which is suppose that you knew this value, right? And I asked the question, instead of figuring out what the minimum coefficient of friction is, what are the minimum and maximum velocities that the person can take the turn with, right? Does that make sense? So to figure that out, that's where you got to go back to the question about what direction is the friction point, right? So suppose that you were given the value of mu, but you didn't know the value of the velocity, then there would be a range of velocities that you could take this turn at, where the maximum velocity you could find by using the friction pointing down the ramp. And for the minimum velocity, you'd make the friction point up the ramp. And those two separate cases would give you like your minimum and your maximum speeds that you could take the ramp at. And this type of a calculation is something you could do if you were like, I guess, I think it's, is it civil engineers that kind of design roads and stuff like that? Is that right? Is it civil engineers? Maybe mechanical, I don't know. A civil, okay. So if you're designing a road and you want to put up a sign, right? And you want to make sure that that sign gives people like a safe speed, then, you know, depending on how the road's constructed, you're going to know based on the banking angle, based on what's the road made out of, like, is it made out of asphalt? Is it made out of concrete, right? And you know what people's tires are made out of. They're mostly made out of rubber, right? So you can, you can actually do, you could do this calculation if you want to, or at least a rough calculation to figure out kind of what speeds the person could could take on the road or you could do the version that we just did you could figure out what is what does my coefficient of friction need to be or how do i need so you see how there's like there's like all these little like knobs and levers that you can turn here because you can alter the the way in which you construct the banking angle you could alter what the road's made out of to make it have more or less grip um obviously more grips better you know it's never gonna be a bad thing if you have have more friction in terms of the situation right friction is not a bad thing it helps you here um, and then you can come up with a range of speeds and then you can figure that out and you can figure out, okay, what's the safe speed? It's probably somewhere in the middle. Let's say your range of speeds is from like 40 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. You could just put a sign up that says 50 miles an hour, right? As your recommended speed for taking the ramp. And that way some people are going to go a little faster and some people are going to go a little slower, but then they can still make it around the ramp with no problem, right? Or around the turn with no problem. Okay. So let's do one more problem. I don't even know if what this slide, actually, this one's really fast. We can do this problem in like five minutes. So. We'll leave, uh, okay, I said 30 minutes early, which would technically be, hmm. we could do, we can do both. Let's just do both of these next time. And instead what we'll do with these last 10 minutes is, uh, just reiterate before next time, try to take a look at this right here. Um, let me make sure, let me see if there's anything else I need to give you. So this is a picture of the, the apparatus that we you would have used. Yeah, you don't have to print this out. Um, by the way, this lab was written by Dr. Stolovy. Yeah, here it is. There's her name right there. If you'll know who she is. So she's the one that put the work together for this. I wonder if you have enough information here to actually start working on it. Because it says, in the real lab, you would take five measurements of theta and average them. I read this, but it was a few weeks ago, so I don't remember everything. 
Here are masses of the velocity of the ball. Okay. So here you have to derive speed derive and then here's the measurements. Okay, so basically I think everything, yeah. Yeah. You'll be able to do all this stuff at home. It's mostly just calculations, <laughs> unfortunately. There's not, there's not much you can do. This is like a simulation of doing the lab. So, okay, I'm gonna close the stream for now and just say that this is uh, the end of, this, the, of the, the videos for today for anyone that's following along on YouTube. And uh, I'll see you all on uh, Wednesday.